This uh, second half, we're going to be looking at the latter-day application of Tarshish and also Tyre. We read together from Isaiah chapter 23, because those are the, 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 that is the chapter that, that gives us an indication that the, the attributes of Tyre move to Tarshish. So we're going to be looking at uh, Tarshish and Tyre. We're going to be looking at Britain's future role going right into the kingdom age, because Tarshish is mentioned there. And then we're going to finally ask ourselves, well, are we on the right track? Is there anything that's, that, that, that's happened in the past that, that indicates to us that our understanding of Britain being that Tarshish power, is there anything to indicate that we, we we're right with that understanding? So those are the eight, um, possibly seven, um, prophecies that uh, we can give a latter-day application um, to. And we're going to look at each one of them and to work out what they are saying and what they would say in relation to Britain if Britain is Tarshish. So we've read together Isaiah 23 and that's where we're going to start. We notice in verse 3 we have a description of what Tyre is. Tyre is the mart of nations. It talks about when we read Ezekiel um, 27, didn't we? All of the things that came from different places that went to Tyre. <coughs> you see, there are nations that trade. So you think of China. China trades. But it isn't the mart of nations. So you might say, well, what's the difference? Well, by and large, China buys in the raw materials that she needs, she makes things, and then she exports them. A mart of nations, such as Tyre was, such as was described in Ezekiel 27, buys all sorts of things from all sorts of places and works out, well, if I buy that from there, then these people over here will, will pay a good price for it and becomes a hub. They are the market where all the different things come and then are distributed to, to those that want them. And that is what Tarshish becomes. That's what Tyre is described as. And I put it to you, is a good description of what this country does. As a trading nation, we buy things and we sell things. We might not even see the physical goods nowadays. But we arrange for A to go to C. And we are the mart, the arranger. But we notice in this interesting chapter, verse 6, says of Tyre, pass ye over to Tarshish. So there's something in Isaiah chapter 23 that God wants us to understand. He's saying that something, some quality of Tyre is going to move from physical Tyre to somewhere else. To, to the nation or to the land of Tarshish. Now, if we sort of summarise what we read in Isaiah 23, we, we can say, first of all, it's a judgement against Tyre. And God will make judgements on this country as well. God will make judgements on all nations of this world. So we need not think that just because we take on the mantle of Tyre, we are, we are special in the sense that we are more righteous than anyone else in this country. Because there are judgments on Tyre, there will be judgments on this nation. It's how we respond to the judgments, I think, that is important. So, it talks about in verse 10 and 11, Pass you through the land as a river, O Tarshish, there is no more strength. So it's talking about almost dark Tarshish being related or entwined with the, the things of Tyre. And it's picked up again in verse 14, isn't it? How you ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. There is this close relationship between Tyre and Tarshish. We're told that she should uh, pass over to Chittim, first of all, uh, at the end of verse 12, but there thou shalt have no rest. So, so initially, the, the trading of Tyre moves to Cyprus, Chittim, but you're not going to have any rest there. You're going to move on. You're going to eventually end up in Tarshish. Now, there's been much 
said about 70 year prophecy in chapters uh, in verses 15 to 17 we haven't got time to look at that uh, this evening but uh, it's very interesting what it says but look where we end this chapter her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord it shall not be treasured nor laid up for her merchandise for shall be shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. The end of this judgment against Tyre talks about merchandise of Tyre or Tyre's descendants being bought for the use of those that are before the Lord. Now, now we know that there is a precedent for that because when Solomon built the temple it was Hiram that bought components for that temple and this seems to be saying that in a latter day application the descendants of Tyre will bring things for those that dwell before the Lord the establishment of the the greater temple uh, uh, that is described in Ezekiel's prophecy so here we see a, a latter day application for Tyre but if you read or if you notice when we read um, together from Ezekiel chapter 27 which is our next reference that there was a different judgment on Tyre in Ezekiel chapter 27 now we didn't read to the end of the chapter but if you go to the very end of Ezekiel chapter 27 God makes this pronouncement on Tyre. The merchants among the people shall hiss at thee, thou shalt be a terror, and never shall be any more. You're not going to be any more, Tyre. You're going to cease to exist. In fact, if you turn over to um, chapter 28 and verse 19, we have it repeated. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shall thou be any more. So has the scripture got muddled up, brother and sisters? Because Isaiah chapter 23 says they're going to be bringing things to, to the Lord in Jerusalem. And Ezekiel 27 says you're not going to exist anymore. Well, that clue is in Isaiah 23. Pass ye over to Tarshish. The qualities of Tyre go to Tarshish. So it is the Tarshish nation that brings the gifts to the Lord when the Lord Jesus Christ is established in his throne in Jerusalem. And we'll pick that up from other places. So we've got to be quite clear that we can link together the prophecies of Tyre with the prophecies concerning Tarshish. And it is by understanding what Tyre was like as the mart of nations that we can better understand what Tarshish is going to be like in the latter days. So if we just summarise what uh, we can uh, glean from Ezekiel 27. I put, if you remember on the first slide, I've got Ezekiel 27 with a couple of question marks over it. I'm not sure how much of Ezekiel 27 has got latter day applications to it. There's not any language in there that makes you think this is definitely latter day. I think what Ezekiel 27 does for us is describes what Tyre was like so that we can then project that forward and say, well, that's what we expect uh, Tarshish to be like in the latter days. And in that sense, it's very, very helpful. But... Tyre becomes and Tarshish will become a proud nation. Chapter 28 and verse 2 uh, of Ezekiel. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said I am a God, and sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou shalt set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel, there is no secret that they can hide from me. Tyre became proud. And historically, the, the monarchy of Tyre said that they were, they were God. You know, they were, they were, they were a deity. Now, 
I don't think that we're perhaps going to see that with Tarshish. I don't think we're going to see the Queen, queen declare herself as, as, as to be a, a deity. But they are proud. And I think this country, after Brexit, if we understand the scriptures correctly, will become increasingly rich and increasingly wealthy, just as Tyre did. And I think this country's arrogance will lift itself up again. And that will be judged at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think this nation will respond to the judgments of God. And they will, I think the scriptures make it clear, they will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and bring gifts to him. And we shall see passages to that. So Ezekiel 27 and Ezekiel 28 say Tyre is going to be no more. But come with me to Psalm 45. Now we can't be dogmatic about Psalm 45. Um, We know Psalm 45 is messianic. It's relating to Solomon, but it also relates to the greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't got time to, to go through all the the messianic elements to it. But in verse 12 of Psalm 45, it says, The daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the the rich among the people shall entreat thy favour. Now, I don't think anybody will argue that this is a messianic psalm. We could argue that, well, that is only fulfilled in Solomon's time because Tyre doesn't exist Um, in in the time of the Lord Jesus returning because Ezekiel says it's going to be no more. That would be one interpretation. Another interpretation is what this is talking about is is that daughter of Tyre where Isaiah 23 says it's going to pass over to to Tarshish. So it is Tarshish that brings the gift in the the second (coughs) fulfilment of this psalm when the Lord Jesus Christ is that great king. In Jerusalem, I don't think we can be dogmatic on it, but I think we will, as we go through other passages, see that 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 interpretation is in line with other scriptures. So let's just think about the people of Tyre, because by looking at them, we can get an idea of what Tarshish will be like in the latter days. It was conquered by Alexander the Great. Uh, It was uh, the Cypriots actually helped. It was the uh, ships of Cyprus that managed to, to help Alexander um, uh, conquer the, the, uh, the city of Tyre. But of course, by the time it was actually conquered, you know, it doesn't take uh, a lot of intelligence to work out that, that most of the Tyrian people would have would have jumped in their ships and have been long gone um, before um, sort of Alexander broke down the walls. If you got any sense, you were going to disappear. Uh, and it, there then is the establishment of. Um, people like Carthage, where the descendants of, of, of the Phoenicians uh, sort of set up trade. So trading carried on after Tyre, but Tyre itself was, was destroyed. Now let's just have a look at a few um, commentators and what they just, how they describe um, the Phoenician people. So these are not from the scriptures, but I think it's helpful for us. So Phoenicia was an ancient civilization composed of independent city-states which lay along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, stretching from what is now Syria and northern Israel. The Phoenicians were a great maritime people. But they were city-states. So it was a, the Phoenician Empire was an empire that was, was based on trade. It wasn't an empire that was based on conquest, although there was you know, an element of, of, um, of coercion sometimes. So... These city-states cooperated together because they had a common goal, trade. But they, they, they went from one to the other, but they were independent. And actually, when you think about Britain and the Commonwealth, that's quite a good parallel. You know, the Commonwealth is independent. We, we were linked together by shared values, by a shared language, but, but they are nevertheless independent, just in the same way as the Phoenician Empire had these independent elements. They, they, they competed with each other. There was a level of competition. It wasn't a, a, a sort of an organised um, command economy. It was a market economy, literally a market economy. Second quote, consequently, the Phoenicians not only imported what they needed and exported what they themselves cultivated and manufactured, 
but they also act as middleman traders. So that when it talks you on the market, mart of nations in Isaiah 23, that's what this is calling, it's giving a different word, middleman trader. You're a middleman trader. And so that's what we should look for if we're looking for a latter day um, tire. The Phoenician alphabet was a phonetic alphabet uh, and it spread. In fact, our alphabet is based on the Phoenician alphabet, but it spread by trade. Different nations sort of transposed their sort of um, hieroglyphic sort of languages into uh, a phonetic Phoenician alphabet to allow trade to take place. In fact, that Ulubaran <coughs> shipwreck, what they found on there was basically writing materials so that people could record, you know, I've, I've bought this much from this person for this price. So, so the alphabet, the Phoenician alphabet, becomes a linking of, of this trading nation. It allows one country to, 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 to trade with another. So we want to look for a country who has an alphabet, or maybe we might say a language, that is the language of trade, that is the language of business. Perhaps think about who that might be. It's quite a long quote, that uh, that top quote, but uh, just halfway down, um, it says that uh, the, the empire, the Phoenician empire, the city-states, carried and transmitted the cultural beliefs and societal norms of the nations they traded with to each other. So, in other words, there was a spread of a culture around their empire. So if they take a language, they take a culture, and they spread it around the empire. And it talks again about them being an uh, ancient middleman. Uh, somebody said to me, you need to use your pointer. So use that point. That one there, um, does this sound familiar? They could thus make enormous gains by selling a commodity at a low value, such as oil or pottery, to another such as uh, for another such as tin and silver, which was not itself valued by the producers, but could fetch enormous prices elsewhere. So if you think of the Phoenicians, well, uh, they traded in amber. Well, amber wasn't very sort of um, thought of up in the Baltic because there was lots of it. But you take amber and you take it down to the Mediterranean, you can get a really good price for it. And if on your return leg you take, say, olive oil, and you take that up to the, to the Baltic you're going to get a really good price for it, whereas somebody in uh, in Israel wouldn't pay you very much for olive oil because there's plenty of it. So so by being able to take one thing from one place and, and move it somewhere else, you can make money. So you can make money on your trade. You're not actually producing anything. You're moving things around and making uh, money for that. And the Phoenicians are primarily um, known for as sailors. They developed a high level of skill in shipbuilding and they were able to navigate the often turbulent waters of the Mediterranean Sea. And what was it that really made their empire sort of great? Well, shipbuilding seems to have been perfected in Byblos, where the design of the curved hull was first initiated. So they had a curved hull, and they had a keel. Now, if any of you know anything about sailing, or are sailors, you'll know that a keel is vitally important. If you've got a keel, your boat is much more stable. So they were able to produce stable boats that they were able to then sail through turbulent waters. They were able to sail out into the Atlantic. They were able to navigate by the stars. They knew where they were. And so, actually, if we put up the similarities between Tyre, that ancient nation, and Britain, you see an awful lot of similarities. They're both maritime nations. We are a maritime nation. We always have been. Our history is maritime. It isn't a land-based economy like the Europeans are, where they traded across land borders. They had city-states. We have a commonwealth. And our commonwealth is something fairly unique. There's not many empires that when the empire disintegrates, they all stay on relatively friendly terms. But the British Empire did. And the commonwealth is something, you know, the the French had an empire. They haven't got a commonwealth like we've got. The Phoenicians spread an alphabet. We spread a language. The English language has gone all around the world. They were a great trading nation. We're a trading nation. We are a trading nation. We might not think it, and we, perhaps because we live here. We don't value it because we're close to where the commodity is produced. They had great expertise in markets. And 
the city of London is a preeminent market. They worked out seagoing technology. They worked out about having a, a keel, a keel hull that could make them um, be able to go further. And it was the same. If you look at well, what was it that really expanded the British Empire, it was the understanding of longitude. You see, latitude is quite easy. You can look at the pole stars and work out where you are latitude. If you want to work out where you are around the globe, longitude, going east to west, you need to know, you can do it looking at the sun, you know, what time you can look at the sun uh, and find out what time noon is, uh, but you need to know, to understand longitude and where you are around the world, you need to know what time it is in your home port. Right? And the only way you could do that was with a watch, basically. And that's what, when, they, when the longitude prize went out, that was, that was the prize. We'll give you a huge amount of money if you can give us some timekeeping method of, of working out longitude. And, I can't remember his name, but the guy that, that, that created the watch allowed the British sailors to go out and find things but be able to come back again because they understood where they were in the world. They understood the latitude and the longitude. So they could go to the Spice Islands, they could go to far-flung places and then they could go back again and again because they knew where they were in the world. And that was one of the great things that, that built the British Empire. So it's interesting that both of them ha- harness the technology that allows them to go and trade in far-off places. We've got the City of London. The City of London is the preeminent market in the world. It hosts three big principal um, types of trade. We have the Baltic Exchange, we have the London Metal Exchange, and then we have you know, the stock market and, and insurance and that sort of thing. The Baltic Exchange encompasses the majority of world shipping interests and commits to a code of conduct overseen by the Baltic. Baltic Exchange members are responsible for a large proportion of all dry cargo and tanker fixtures, as well as the sale and purchase of merchant vessels. So people say, well, how can Britain be a maritime power? You know, our navy is about six ships now. Um, you know, we, we, weren't, we weren't the navy we used to be. Well, well, we're not. But we're a maritime trade nation. If you want to book shipping from China to India, you go to the Baltic and say, how much will cost me and, and they will they will give you a price. There's a market for pricing in maritime things. And so most of the world's trade in shipping is done. City of London, the world's leading global share trading centre. Uh, I've got a financial global centre index. <coughs> London is number one. Um, New York is number two. To be honest, if you go and look London and New York, sort of, they're almost identical in size, and you, you can find the uh, charts will give New York number one and, and London number two. But it is, you know, in the world, it is one of the biggest trade markets. And how about this? You know, we talked about what's traded in, what's traded from Tarshish? Silver, tin, lead. London Metal Exchange, 80% of global non ferrous metal business. Is done on the London Metal Exchange. If you want to know the price of your aluminium, you go to the LME. If you want to know what the price of copper is, you go to the LME. They are the market. Now, the copper might not come to this country. It might go from you know the mine to South Africa or something like that. But the price is set by the London Metal Exchange. We are the mart of nations. And we fit in very well with what is described in Ezekiel 27. City of London, um, this is from their website, 20% of global foreign equity listings are done on the long London Stock Exchange. 18% of cross-border lending is arranged in the UK. Interestingly, Mark Carney this week was saying, actually, the biggest risk now uh, to the economy is not from Brexit, but the risk is from is to Europe itself from Brexit. Europe... Uh, has got potentially big problems because Europe needs the financial services that the City of London provides. It is the City of London that that ensures deals are paid for, um, commodities are paid for, insurance is sorted out. And if and if Europe puts up barriers to the City of London, the biggest loser of that will actually be Europe itself because it is its hub 
that that arranges finances, arranges insurance for the rest of the world. Now, on this slide, top ten economies best to set up trade. We actually only come sixth, uh, but we're the biggest um, economy. Uh, well, Germany would be the biggest economy. They're slightly bigger than us. They're down at number ten. We come in at number six. But when you look, we're bigger than all the ones uh, above us. But then when you look at it, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, well, they're, they're all part of you know, the Tarshish group of nations, aren't they? They're all things where uh, the British have had influence over us, or British have had influence over them. So uh, we, we rank sixth, world-class border administration, um, second in terms of availability of information technology, first in terms of internet use for business to consumer, strong protection of property rights, uh, and then it just says at the end, just as with other advanced economies, market access remains a weak spot. Well, part of that problem is because we're part of the European Union. So market access is uh, is governed by the single market, which is obviously, as we all know, something that is being hotly debated. Do we stay in that single market? Do we take uh, our, um, our chances on, on the world without being part of a customs union? Well, uh, only... Uh, uh, this uh, last week, um, uh, the Australian, the ex-Australian ex-Prime Minister has said Brexit has shown that Britain is a great country and it is ready to become a global leader, uh, he declared. And uh, from uh, September, Theresa May says Britain will be one of the world's greatest trading nations post-Brexit. Interesting, if you remember back before the referendum, what were people saying? If you broke for Brexit... And what you're voting for is to be insular and inward looking and, you know, not bothered about uh, anything else apart from yourself and be a protectionist nation. That's what they said would be the result of voting for Brexit. But in actual fact, the opposite has happened, hasn't it? The, the, the country has sort of said, hang on a minute, we might lose access to that, that nice convenient market that's on our, our doorstep. So we better have a look around for somewhere else to trade with. We better perhaps... Um, try and wake up those friends that we had in the Commonwealth, you know, and see if we can trade with them. Perhaps the Americans will trade with us. Britain has become very outward-looking now because it knows it's going to probably have to replace some of its trade with Europe with, with other sources of income. And uh, this was uh, only published this week. Britain will become a beacon of global free trade and create 400,000 jobs if it quits the custom union, a single market, uh, as part of Brexit negotiations. So, you know, there is a, 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 an increasing looking for this country to go back to its trading roots, to be that mart of nations, because there we see we can make money. OK, let's just have a look at uh, our next uh, reference, which is Ezekiel 38. Now, Ezekiel 38 um, is well known to us, isn't it? forms part of our traditional understanding of uh, the events heralding the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is that little verse, isn't there, in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. We know what they say, that they're friendly towards Israel. They're worried about trade, <coughs> how you come away to take all this gold and silver. Uh, but we have quite a description there of Tarshish and who she is associated with. So we see that at the end, Tarshish is around. She is a nation that uh, is friendly with Sheba and Dedan. And we're going to look at that in a few moments. But it's this phrase, all the young lions thereof, that we want to look at first. Now, if you speak to the sceptic, the sceptic will say, oh, actually, when it says young lions, it means villages. Uh, and it can mean villages, once they've translated it as villages. Uh, in the authorised version, 30 times, they've translated it as lion. So lion in, would seem to be a more appropriate uh, translation. But come with me to Ezekiel chapter 19, because so often, when we think, well, what is meant by this phrase... The scripture comes to our aid and says, well, if you want to know what's been meant, go and have a look somewhere else. And Ezekiel 19, I think, gives us a fantastic description of what we should be looking for 
when we have the phrase, the young lions. So let's just read Ezekiel chapter 19 in the first five or six verses. It's not related to Tarshish, but the theme is the same. Moreover, take thou up a lamentation for the princes of Israel. So it's to do with rulers, princes of Israel. And say, what is thy mother? A lioness. She lay down, lay, she lay down among the lions. <coughs> she nourished her whelps among young lions. And that's that word that we have in Ezekiel 38. Um, she brought up one of her whelps. That's a very young lion. It became a young lion. It learned to catch the prey. It devoured men. So we see a progression. So we've got mother lion, who's a ruler of some sort. She sits down with the lions, and it's a lamentation to the princes. So she's a, she's got a ruling uh, position. She takes a young lion. So, so a young lion is a, a lion that is dependent on its mother for nourishment. It can't catch its own prey. But that, that whelp, that very young lion, becomes a young lion, a, a kepir uh, in the Hebrew, and it can catch its own prey. Now, when a lion can catch its own prey, it's independent. It can go and live on its own. It can feed itself. So when we're talking about young lions, we're talking about independent nations... And yet, they've got an affinity to their mother. Because, just go on, uh, let's read what uh, the rest of the chapters or the verses say. The nations also heard of him, and he was taken into the pit, and they brought him with chains into the land of Egypt. Well, that's to do with the, with the, the prophecy uh, in the first instance. Now, when she saw that she had waited and her hope was lost, so, yes, this young lion is independent, and yet, mother lion is, is worried about it. She's, 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 she's upset because her hope has lost. It, it's been taken away. Then she took another of her whelps, so a, a, a lion that is dependent upon her, and makes him a young lion, an independent lion. And he went um, down among the lions and becomes a young lion and learns to catch prey. So he becomes independent. So, so from this uh, little description here, we can understand how God is using this idea of a young lion. It is related to its mother. It has a relationship with its mother still. Mother was upset because of something that happened to to the young lion. But it is independent. It is just like the Commonwealth. If we go back to the days of empire, then the the nations of the empire were like the whelps. They had to be fed by the British nation. They weren't independent. But, but since the Second World War, most of the Commonwealth nations, almost all the Commonwealth nations, uh, they've become independent. They have become whelps. They've come from being whelps, they've become young lions. They are able to look after themselves. But there is still this relationship with the mother lion. So isn't it wonderful that, that what we see described in Ezekiel 38... Tarshish and the young lions fits exactly with that picture of of Britain and a a commonwealth. And we know, I'm sure you've seen uh, in the past, these sort of uh, pictures. You know, even people in this country, you know, understand lion being representative of this nation. And it talks about, you know, uh, we could have been written by a Christophe apart from this for war, so it wouldn't have been, but, uh, you know, uh, helped by the young lions, the old lion defies his foes. It, it's picked up that relationship between the, the mother lion and the, the old lion, really out of, exactly out of uh, what we see in Ezekiel. And of course we know it's a heraldic symbol of this country, the lion. There are other nations that have the lion as well, but it, it fits in with what we want. Uh, you can buy uh, uh, the Queen's Beast, a solid gold coin from, from the... Uh, uh, Royal Mint there, if you've got a thousand pounds and have a lion. So it fits in. And of course, you know, uh, this is the drive now, isn't it? If we're going to be not in the EU, where are we going to look for our trade? 
and uh, here we've got uh, Tony Abbott saying, well, what should we do, which is the question at the moment, should we quit the customs union, should we stay in the customs union, should we have a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit? Well, he's saying, look, quit. Quit that customs union because it holds you back because you can't make your own deal. Quit that and come and join the Commonwealth. And he says, well, you know, UK's exports to, uh, to the Commonwealth is, is only 8%, but we can grow that. We can make that bigger. We can make it a more important share of Britain's trading wealth. And it's interesting that our biggest trade partner is the United States. Now, people will say, well, yeah, the EU is the biggest, but as, as a block, it is the biggest. But in terms of individual countries, we trade more with America than we do with Germany. So it, it is the Commonwealth nations and, and America that, uh, that are the place where we can look to replace trade that will be lost from quitting the uh, trade block. This was uh, uh, quite a tongue-in-cheek article, actually, from the... Uh, the Telegraph has written, I'm sure the guy must be Australian, uh, but he says, just to be clear, I've written, Australia has never really forgiven you for abandoning us in favour of the common market in 1973. And we perhaps forget that, that when Britain went into the common market, its previous deals that it did with its Commonwealth nations had to be forgotten about. It was now part of this customs union, so it was, it was organised externally by what the, uh, the EU said you could do. And, you know, a lot of Commonwealth countries, they weren't very happy about that. So almost two centuries, he says, until 1973, Australia had been Britain's loyal little brother, looking up to you, trying to impress you, seeking your approval, trading with you, taking whatever poor souls the bailiffs and the sheriffs had swept from the streets of London, Liverpool and Leamington Spa, and giving them a new home in the sun by the sea, no less. Perhaps a tactical error on your part, he says, uh, which I think uh, is quite... A, Quite amusing. But he says, 1973, to a lot of the Commonwealth countries, 1973 was a kick in the guts, he says. Uh, you know, um, and we remember that. And he says, well, actually, why not renew those, uh, those ties that we had? Accepting Australia's hand of friendship would be a fantastic make good for that decision to abandon us 44 years ago. Finally, not only would Australia have Big Brother's approval, but there'd be a sense that Big Brother actually needs us once again. We'd be useful beyond being somewhere to send uh, Prince Charles. <laughs> he does go away, he says, that's a romanticised version, he then goes on, he's a bit more practical and, and talks about trade. But, but, but it's, a, you know, it's, it's an interesting picture and it's been interesting, hasn't it, since Brexit, how many um, Commonwealth countries have said, actually, we'll do a trade deal with you. Yeah, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's be friendly to one another, let's help one another. And the, the hand of friendship has, uh, has been extended. And so Australia, New Zealand was one of the first ones that said, you know, we'll do a trade deal with you and we'll help you out, you know, and if you want some expertise in doing trade deals, you know, we're there to help you. There is that friendship uh, between these nations. Canada, EU, well, we talked about this at the Prophecy Day in October, didn't we? That big um, CETA deal that's supposed to be being done by the EU uh, and Canada, which might or might not survive. But, but either way, what Canadians are saying is if we conclude that deal with the EU... Then as soon as Britain leaves the EU, it doesn't make any difference to that trade deal at all. We will recognise that trade deal with Britain, even if trade Britain is independent of the EU. And I think there will probably be quite a lot of other countries that have got trade deals with the EU that will say, you know, once Britain's gone, we'll still trade with you in the same terms as we did before. It's in nobody's interest to put barriers up. And so uh, she says in this article, well, actually... We want to keep that deal and we want to build on it as well. We want to strengthen those ties. And of course, Boris has just come back from uh, seeing Trump. That must have been an No, he hasn't seen Trump yet, has he? he went to see the, uh, he's not allowed to go see Trump yet. He went to see his, um, his administration. Uh, but he's coming back and saying, well, yeah, the Americans want to do a free trade deal and they want to do it fast. They want to get on with it, uh, which will be interesting. Um, it depends whether they want to wait for two years. That'll be halfway through Trump's presidency. Um, before they do it, um, it would be interesting to see. But, he says, uh, there's a very large measure of understanding that now is the time to do a free trade deal. You see, Trump's got a similar problem to the problem that this government's got. He's saying, I'm going to rip up some of the trade deals I've got, the, the, the Mexican one and the, and the TIP um, deal that uh, was, was almost uh, finalised. I'm going to rip those up because I don't think they're very good. But he wants something to replace it. And he thinks doing a deal with Britain would be good and 
you know, if Britain also just deals with Australia and New Zealand and Commonwealth countries, you know, that maybe they can uh, they can do something there as well. So he's got a similar problem. He doesn't want to lose all his trade. He wants to just have um, fairer or better trade. Uh, Theresa May went to India again, big Commonwealth country, and you know, often people would see that as being an Eastern Tarshish um, power, but uh, the, the, the the visit from um, May didn't go as well as uh, I think people hoped. Yeah. But uh, that people are saying, well, you need to, to spend time on it. It's not something that you can do quickly because their economy is quite different to ours. You can do a deal with someone like Australia or New Zealand quite quickly because they're very very similar economies. Uh, India is uh, not quite uh, at the same stage yet. And it goes on to say on that article that uh, Australia, Canada and New Zealand are all in the process of doing free trade agreements with uh, the Indians, and they've taken five or six years so far. So they're thinking that as being a, a sort of a, a latter uh, step, uh, um, that, we, that we would have to wait longer for that. But still will be a prize worth fulfilling. But let's go back to it's equal 38, because there's one more element that we haven't looked at, isn't there? And that is those two other places that are mentioned, Seba and Didam. Generally, they're associated with Saudi Arabia. Interestingly, when we were reading Ezekiel 27, all the places that uh, Tarshish dealt with, notice that they were both in there. They were places where uh, Tarsh, uh, Tyre uh, dealt with um, in Ezekiel 27. So, trading nations associated with this Tarshish power. And we know that uh, you know, Britain has got historical uh, uh, ties. We've just opened a, a naval base uh, in the, uh, uh, the Gulf area again, the first time since um, we closed one, I think, after, um, after Suez. So we've gone back in there militarily. But uh, this is Theresa May with the Gulf Corporation uh, Council. She said that last year trade between the UK and the Gulf was worth more than 30 billion uh, and at the same time Gulf investment in the UK was helping to regenerate cities from Aberdeen to Teesside and Manchester to London. It's the classic Syrian philosophy. What have you got that is valuable to me and what have I got that is valuable to you? So the Gulf has got lots of money we haven't got a huge amount of money uh, in this country. We've got, a, um, we've got debt. But of course, they need security. They've got big, nasty neighbours that uh, are quite happy to swallow them up. And Britain has got an understanding of military power. The Navy might be smaller than it was, but we can train people. The uh, Bahraini uh, uh, security forces and armies trained by the British as uh, there's lots of uh, security cooperation. So it's the classic, I've got something that you might want, and you've got something that I might want, and we can do a deal. So there she went over there. There's been quite a few um, people that have gone over to the Gulf. It's seen as a very important uh, place to, to increase trade with. Here Theresa May, she's on uh, the, the deck of uh, HMS Ocean, uh, which is in the, in the Gulf. Uh, and interestingly... Uh, Britain is now in charge of the coalition naval, naval operation um, in the Gulf. The American uh, aircraft carrier has gone home, uh, so there's no aircraft carrier in the area at the moment, but the British with uh, HMS Ocean are in command of, uh, of that area. And interesting, that's the first time the British have been in command. The Americans normally, uh, for obvious reasons, are, are in command. Uh, but just at the time when we're starting to look around and think, well, you know, are we right? I uh, think, who is this Tarshish power? Uh, Britain pops up and is in command in the Gulf. Hammond, uh, I thought it was quite interesting here, it's just, you know, Hammond becomes the latest minister to visit the Gulf uh, in the UK's Middle East charm offensive. Um, and he's followed uh, uh, Theresa May and Boris Johnson who have already been there. You know, Britain is saying this is very important to us. So what are the two places that Tarshish is looking to to trade with Shiva and Didan and the Young Lions. Isn't that remarkable? What other country fits the bill? But 
this country still has to be judged by the Lord God. We saw those prophecies against Tyre. We saw pride. We saw wealth. If Britain is going to be that country that brings wealth to the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, unfortunately, that wealth will be generated at the expense of pride. And we know that as a country, we, have, we are a proud nation and we are also a godless nation. You know, it said in, uh, in the Second World War, you know, when the troops were in uh, uh, Dunkirk, you know, needing to be evacuated, you know, um, Winston Churchill called for a national day of prayer that the, troops, the British troops might be rescued from, from the, uh, the shores of France and brought back safely, and they were. But I don't think now, if uh, the Prime Minister called for a, a national day of prayer, you would get much of a response. We have become a godless country, and the morals of this country are, well, we probably won't comment on them, we know what they're like. So Britain has got to be judged, and the scriptures are clear. So if we come to Psalm 48, we are told something about the humbling of the Tarshish nation. It's only just a little verse, just popped in. Again, Psalm 48, uh, we know it's messianic, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for the situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. We know it's talking about the future. It talks about the sides of the north. We only get the sides of the north in Zion after the earthquake. There's no, there's no drop-off uh, north of Jerusalem. The, the hillside goes upwards. It's only after Ezekiel's um, earthquake that, the, uh, that you've got the sides of the north. So we know this is kingdom age. But what does it tell us? Well, thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. There's going to be something that destroys the ships of Tarshish. Maybe it will be the, those nice, big, shiny aircraft carriers that are being built and being finished at the moment. But Britain's power has got to be humbled. Her ships, as it were, have got to be broken. Psalm 72. Well, whenever we want to talk about the kingdom and what it will be like, when we're doing lectures, we turn to Psalm 72, don't we? Psalm 22 gives us quite a bit of interesting informa- information. The Tarshish is mentioned in verse 10. Well, let's just go in at verse 8. This great ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be in control. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. Might be a reference to Shiva and Dina, but uh, uh, we don't know. And the enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents. But two classes of nations, I think, there. First 11, perhaps, um, makes it explicit that everybody's going to have to fall down. All the kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So all nations are going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Some are going to lick the dust. They're going to be forced to submit. And there are going to be other nations that are going to bring presents. Sheba, sorry, um, Tarshish and the Isles shall bring presents the kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. So this country is going to be humbled. It is going to have to accept the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. But some countries will accept that with more grace than others. And Tarshish and Sheba bring gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can perhaps imagine that the part of our Protestant culture, forgotten now in the large part, acceptance of the scriptures and the word of God, but still there in our culture, will mean that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth and calls on nations to obey, that there perhaps will be nations like Britain, nations like Commonwealth countries that 
that have had the word of God and that have an understanding, maybe it might be in a dim and distant past, but have an understanding, will accept and say, we will accept and we will bring you gifts. We will bring you of our wealth. That's what it seems to be um, inferring there, doesn't it? They're going to bring something as an offering. They're not just going to lick the dust and grudgingly accept, like some nations will. They will actually say, well, uh, we accept you and, and, and we'll, uh, we'll bring you gifts as well. So we're linked to the Isles. We're linked to Sheba and Seba, just uh, as, uh, as we would expect from the other passages that, uh, that talk about Tarshish. Isaiah chapter 2. Again, kingdom words, aren't they? Shall come to pass in verse 2 in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills. Again, an earthquake language. And all nations shall flow unto it. In verse 16. And upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the pleasant pictures or the wealth I think, and the loftiness of man shall be brought down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord in alone shall be exalted in that day. So again, a, a picture of humbling. All the ships of Tarshish, they're going to be bowed down. The loftiness of man. Man's wisdom in himself. What did he say of, of the king of Tar? Your knowledge is greater than Daniel. And Daniel was you know, one of the wisest of men uh, in the Babylonian Empire. That arrogance of man worshipping himself, worshipping his own intellect, worshipping creations that, that he makes, has got to be bowed down. And this nation will have to, to be bowed down to the Lord Jesus as well. Yeah, let's carry on in Isaiah to Isaiah and chapter 60. Because there is a humbling, but with Tarshish, there is a response that is more pleasing to God than perhaps uh, other nations. So verse 1, Arise, shine, for the light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So that's the world that we see now, isn't it? Gross darkness. Very few have any understanding of God. Very few have a belief in God. But it tells us in verse 9, Surely the isles shall wait for me. The ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them. Unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified thee. Now we know that when the Lord Jesus Christ is established in Jerusalem there will be the call for his people, the Jewish people, to come back. In fact, it's been said that the nation or the kingdom won't be properly established until all the Jews are back in their land. And so they need to be brought back and who's going to help? It's going to be Tarshish. The ships of Tarshish first shall bring thy sons from afar. So this humbled nation, this nation that has been forced to accept that, that they're not in control, God is in control, will bring gifts to the Lord Jesus, but will also help to bring his people back to the nation of Israel. And let's just flick on to Isaiah and uh, chapter 66 for I think as a, I think as our final little run through of uh, of chapters to do with Tarshish, in verse 19. So verse 18 for connection. I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory and I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape unto them unto the nations to Tarshish and uh, 
and uh, there's a list there given. Verse 20, And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations. So Isaiah 66 is saying, well, from those people that escaped from the destruction of, 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 of this, the, 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 the nation of Israel uh, before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed, they're going to be sent to the nations. So they're going to be sent to Tarshish. They're going to be told about the things of God. And they're going to say, Jesus wants an offering from you. He wants something to demonstrate your acceptance. <coughs> and what is it here? I think it will be gold and silver and wealth. That's the end of Isaiah um, that we read together, Isaiah 23. But here, the offering is also bringing the Jewish people. So, so God is saying, right, well, if you're going to accept me, demonstrate your acceptance by going and bringing the Jewish people from the ends of the earth and bringing them back to my land. And he says, Tarshish is going to, to do that. They're going to, they're going to have the message and they're going to help. Um, so I think there's a conversion of this nation to understand the things of God, to take them back to their, their Protestant heritage, tell them that they've gone away from the things of the Bible. No other nation really has, has published the Bible in so many different nations by, by spreading its English language and spreading the, the, the King James Version of the Bible around the world. But this nation has. So when we come to our, our little summary, our little um, tick boxes, as it were, I don't think you can find any other nation that fits so perfectly. We've looked at things like tin. We've looked at things like being in the West. We've looked at things like being sea power. We've looked at them being friendly with Shiva and Dina. We've seen how they have to have a colonial element. There has to be some commonwealth. There has to be the young lions. Who are they? If it's not Britain, who are they, the young lions, with other nations? And we've seen there on uh, that Britain is a great trading nation in the, in the image of Tyre from what the scriptures tell us. And brethren and sisters, are we on the right track? How do we know that this interpretation could be right? Well, if we have an interpretation, then we want to test it, don't we? We want to say, well, have people interpreted this like we have done this evening, in the past, and have some of the things that they've said as a result of thinking that Britain is Tarshish, have some of the things that they've said come true? Can we go back and, and test? Well, I think we can, brothers and sisters. Brother Thomas says in Alpis Israel, there is a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a man writing before any idea of the Jews going back to their land. It was a glimmer in his understanding, and a lot of people were ridiculed him at the time, for thinking that the nation of Israel will go back to the land. They've not been there for 1900 years. How are they going to go back? He pie in the sky, uh, Dr. Thomas, thinking that that's what the scriptures say. But he says, well, they've got to go back. And not only that, because I understand who Tarshish is, I say that when they go back, they're going to go under the protection of the British power. Now, I don't say that Brother Thomas got everything right in his understanding of the nation of Israel. I think he thought that it wasn't going to be long before uh, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ after the, king, after the nation of Israel was going to be established. But here was a man who was writing a hundred years before the establishment of the nation of Israel as an independent nation. He's writing 70 years before the British mandate for Palestine. And he's saying, based on my understanding of who Tarshish is, I tell you that the person that protects them and the purpose that person that helps them to to go back to the land is going to be the British people. And he says in his uh, Kingdom Age, 1853, he says, the drying up of the river, which is in part the destruction of Turkey, will render it necessary for the British power, which then extends to the Euphrates, to promote the return of the Jews to their own land by extending its protection over it and holding out every inducement for the sons of Abraham to repair to it. And it was the case, wasn't it? I mean, now we can look at the end of the British mandate and say, well, you know, the British really couldn't 
sort out the, the problem of the returning Jews after the First World War, after the Second World War. But, but the British were friendly. The British did say to, in the Balfour um, Declaration, you know, we're, we're supportive of a homeland for the Jews. It was that that helped give impetus to that desire for the nation of uh, Israel to go back to their ancient land. And there's a New York Herald. Jerusalem is rescued for the, by the British after 673 years of Muslim rule. It was the British that freed the land. And when the mandate was set up in um, 1920, who was it that had the mandate for Palestine? It was the British. The Sykes-Picot agreement during the war said, well, the French and the British, we can't decide who has Jerusalem, so um, we'll make it international. But when it came down to it, it was the British that took the land of Israel, and it was the British that were given the mandate for Palestine. So sometimes when you look at, well, where did the tin come from, you really come down to two places it could come from. It could have come from Brittany in France, or it could come from Cornwall and Devon, in Great Britain. And if you're not quite sure, well, which one was it? Which one has God got his eye on in terms of future sort of prophecy? Well, the French were nearly there. They got Syria. <laughs> the British were there. They got the Holy Land. And that's what Brother Thomas understood and predicted because Brother Thomas understood from his scriptures who the Tarshish power were. Brethren and sisters, surely that is our encouragement that Brother Thomas did get it right and we are not on the wrong track when we still say that the British power is Tarshish. Brethren and sisters, I have spent a lot of time looking at this subject. I started off thinking, well, what am I going to find? And what I have found has been fascinating to me but interestingly, what I have also found is when you go back to Brother Thomas's time, you can find copious um, writings of people that say, yes, you know, Britain is, is the Phoenician people, the, uh, the Aryan race uh, comes from the Phoenicians, and yes, it, it, everybody accepted that Britain was the Tarshish power. And then after the, first, after the Second World War, partly because the idea of an Aryan race had such bad press with, with what Hitler did, People went away from the idea of Britain being that Tarshish power. And, and I just, obviously archaeologists sort of came in and said, well, they couldn't have, they couldn't have gone that far with their ships. They, they couldn't have traded. But most of the evidence that I have found that to me convincingly tells me that Britain had links with the Tarshish power going right back before the Phoenicians is from the, probably the last 15, 20 years. Isotope matching of tin so you can say where it came from has only come in quite recently shipwreck discoveries in, in the uh, Aegean uh, of the Uyuliburan and uh, off the coast of this country they've only come in in the last sort of 20 years ago in our age there is a wealth of information that allows us to say of all the countries where they could have got the tin from Britain fits best and brethren and sisters, I think that's remarkable. That God, just like he did in the 19th century, helped the archaeologists prove the Bible. Now, the archaeologists again can say to us, look, there's plenty of evidence that the tin that the Phoenicians traded came from Cornwall. And Britain is Tarshish of the scripture.